Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we have Dr. Will Cole, functional medicine practitioner, here to talk about all things inflammation. Inflammation is a term we've all heard, and it's the common link between every chronic disease that's out there, but what does it really mean, and how do we get to the root of what's causing this chronic inflammation? Will Cole's here to talk about all that and more. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, biohacking, mindfulness, and functional medicine with the goal of helping you understand how your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Prode, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is one of my good friends, Dr. Will Cole. Dr. Will Cole is a leading functional medicine expert and the co-host of the Goop Fellows podcast. He specializes in clinically investigating underlying factors of chronic disease and customizing health programs for thyroid issues, autoimmune conditions, hormonal dysfunction, digestive disorders, and brain challenges. Dr. Cole was named one of the top 50 functional medicine and integrative experts in the nation and is a health expert for Mind Body Green and Goop, amongst many others. He consults with people from all around the world at drwillcole.com and locally in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Will Cole is the author of the book Ketotarian and the newly released book, The Inflammation Spectrum, which is out now officially as of two days ago. Go get it. Go check it out on Amazon, How to Find Your Food Triggers and Reset Your System. Dr. Cole, welcome back to the podcast. My friend, I'm so excited that we're talking. Yeah, super excited. Everybody hears the word inflammation. And yet, it's kind of like if you walk down the street. One time they did this funny segment, I think it was on Jimmy Kimmel, where he walked out onto the street and he asked people and he said, you know, he was talking about gluten and he was making fun of LA <laughs> and how so many people avoid gluten but have yeah. no freaking clue what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, It was a hilarious segment. I don't yeah. know if it was Jimmy Kimmel or if it was like one of the other guys. Yeah, I've seen similar things. And it was yeah. so funny, um, <laughs> but I digress. Inflammation is one of those things that people have heard of. They kind of think they know what it means. Yeah. Listeners of this podcast have a better sense, but I always like to start off with the obvious because I realize that we have to ask the dumb questions, be willing to learn if we don't know. So break it down. What do you mean yeah. when you talk about inflammation? Yeah, good question. Good way, good place to start. So it is a ambiguous term for many people or a nebulous. They don't really know specifically what it is they oftentimes think of maybe achy joints or muscles or maybe a migraine um, soreness people can get behind that they understand that um, but beyond that it's so much more than that as far as human health it's so much more than that as it relates to just real life stuff of how millions and millions of people are experiencing and what they're going through. So inflammation is the commonality between just about every health problem we face as a society, from autoimmune conditions to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, digestive problems, fibromyalgia, to things that don't seem inflammatory to the layperson, but is in fact inflammatory. Things like anxiety and depression and fatigue and brain fog. There's a whole field of research that obviously you know about, but many people don't. The cytokine model of cognitive function, basically how inflammation is impacting our brains. And there's an epidemic rise of mental health problems. And we like to separate mental health from physical health, but mental health is physical health our brains and our bodies uh, and we should not treat it as some sort of esoteric ethereal thing it is quite physiological uh, and the main driver of those problems is inflammation the main commonality is chronic inflammation so inflammation can also be you know we talk about it in the context of being kind of a negative or a mm -hmm. thing that we want to stay away from but it also can be a good thing so can you also just yeah. lay the groundwork for how inflammation can play a positive result, uh, role in the body and is actually a, almost like a defense mechanism. Absolutely. So inflammation is not inherently bad. It's chronic inflammation that's the problem. So inflammation is a product of our immune system. We need it. We need healthy, balanced inflammation. It fights viruses and bacteria. It keeps our body nice and healthy when it's balanced. The pro It's the Goldilocks principle, right? It's not too high, not too low, but just right. Our gut microbiome, we want it balanced. Our hormones, we want it balanced. Inflammation, we want it balanced. So that is the same uh, law in the body is applied here when it comes to inflammation. The problem is most people in the West around the world are struggling with 
too much inflammation for too long. It's like a forest fire that's burning, low grade burning in perpetuity. It's not good. It's going to create destruction uh, and there's a lack of balance in people's body. And I think you can see a lot of parallels between what's going on environmentally as far as climate change is concerned, a lack of balance on an environmental level and what's going on on a microcosm level in people's body. They have climate change. They have... Yeah, the earth is heating up, but our body's also heating up too. Exactly. Uh, and it's disrupting of balance uh, on a on a micro and macro level so you write in your book and i want to connect this to you've talked about chronic disease and chronic inflammation and how that's the common thread you know we have this epidemic of chronic diseases that's been going on now for the past 100 150 years mm -hmm. more diseases today are related to chronic diseases where we used to die of of sort of uh not enough nutrition mm -hmm. bacteria you know, uh, infections, viruses, that sort of thing. More yeah. people are now dying because of heart disease, cancer, which was not how it was, uh, you know, at least a yeah. hundred years ago. Yeah. So you have this quote from your book and you say, by the time a health problem has av advanced enough to be officially diagnosed, inflammation has typically already caused significant damage to the body. So you talk about chronic disease and it being inflammation being the co common link, but most people haven't gone to their doctor and their doctor has said, Hey, you have, they just hear a diagnosis. Hey, mm -hmm. you have cancer. Hey, you have heart disease. Hey, you have dementia. Hey, you have this. Yeah. Most people, unless they're working with an integrative doctor or functional medicine doctor yeah. have never been told like, Hey, you have inflammation. So what's going on over there? Yeah, I think it, we are very reactionary in our modern approach to healthcare in our conventional setting. We wait until things are really bad for us to give it an ICD-10 code, a diagnosis code and say, you have a problem. You have God forbid diabetes or an autoimmune condition. Well, those things didn't happen overnight. Like you said, it's about four to 10 years prior to that diagnosis is when these things started brewing. Hence the title of the book is the inflammation spectrum, meaning it, it exists on a continuum. So from mild grade symptoms like low grade fatigue, background anxiety, say mild, moderate digestive problems on one end of the inflammation spectrum, all the way to the other end of the inflammation spectrum, which is the full blown, it fits the criteria to be diagnosed. It's given a diagnosis code like an autoimmune condition or diabetes or a mental health problem. And then there's everything in between on that continuum. So it's important no matter where you're at on the inflammation spectrum, no matter what you're going through to find out what's going on, check in with yourself first. Like, am I feeling the way that I should feel for optimal health? Because a lot of people are just going about their life and they're not questioning why they feel the way that they do. They're not even realizing maybe the the bloating or the, the constipation or the background anxiety. They think just because it's common, they equate that with normalcy. Ubiquity doesn't necessarily equate with normalcy. And and to and to piggyback on that, a lot of people feel off. They're yeah. not sleeping well. They do have regular bloating. Mm -hmm. They notice that maybe their mood is a little bit different than it was ten years ago. So they go to the doctor. They go to the physician, and they get a clean bill of health. They walk away and they say, "Well, everything's normal. I don't have nothing yeah. to tell you." So what's going on in those situations? <clears throat> yeah. So that's uh, a problem. So you're right. Even if people are. Uh, in tune with their body enough, you're right, that's what happens. They go to their doctor, they know intuitively, hey, they ha had that that reckoning with themselves to say, hey, I have to go get this checked out. And the doctor says, everything's fine, these labs are fine, you're just depressed, here's an antidepressant. Or maybe you're not even fully depressed yet. Yeah. Just kind of... Yeah, or they say things like, you're, just, normal, you're just stressed. Older. Yeah, you're just stressed, you're a new mom, you're just getting older, you just need to lose weight, all these sort of reasons. But what they're unintentionally telling their patient is you're a lot like the other people with health problems that make up the reference range that they're being compared to because the reference range on standard labs is not looking at optimal health. It's just looking at, at the population of people who go to labs the population uh, in the nation. So it's really, uh, uh, and that's not the healthiest bunch of people. So you're being compared to people that with predominant health problems. And then if you're in that range, they're saying everything's fine. Well, that's where functional medicine comes in. And we and, look at it a little bit more nuanced. And really a core part of your book is first, as you said earlier, checking in with yourself because yeah. you know your body. You know if something's off, you know if something is working and you know if something's not working, you at least know how you feel mm -hmm. and you know what symptoms you're experiencing. Is that the primary way that people can understand before we get into laboratory testing? Is that the first step in understanding where you fit on the inflammation spectrum? I think so. And I think that's the great part of books and podcasts and 
uh, and online articles is because these are low cost or no cost free things that people can start to take agency on their health and take responsibility for it and understand themselves and empower themselves. So I think that's a good starting point. And I start the book out with the quiz so that's adapted from questions that I just, I ask patients. What are some examples of those questions you ask so patients? So we, we go through the different sections of the inflammation spectrum and the whole concept of inflammation spectrum, I just really put in the book because it's how I saw it in my clinic over the years. So we look at the brain, we look at the hormone system, we look at the detox system, we look at the blood sugar system, we look at the musculoskeletal system, we look at something called polyinflammation, this interconnectedness of the body that, for example, like inflammation in the gut, the second brain can impact uh, brain and neurological inflammation through the gut brain axis and the vagus nerve. So we're checking in through all the different areas. So for example, there's some uh, little clinical pearls or health history pearls that we see in functional medicine that give us clues as to what labs are the most relevant, which ones aren't so much relevant, like the outer third of your eyebrows thinning. It maybe seems like, why are they asking that from a layperson standpoint? But it's a clinical sign that there may be a thyroid problem that's off or maybe that someone's craving salty foods. There may be an issue with the HPA axis, the brain adrenal axis, and so on and so forth. We go through all the systems of the body and look at all these health history pearls that I would normally ask a patient that I want patients to, or the reader of the book to ask for themselves to see where, where am I at on the inflammation spectrum? Because the more these things are off, that's going to be a subclinical sign you know, through the questionnaire, through the quiz to see, hey, this isn't normal. This is just common for me. And that then inspires the reader, inspires the person to say, let's do something about it. And I think that's a big idea in the book. A big idea is that most of what we're dealing with, you know, don't wait for a diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, there are people that are out there that have it. But in general, if you find yourself and there are areas of your life where maybe you don't feel the best, mm -hmm. but you don't have a full-blown diagnosis of something yet. Don't wait for a diagnosis. Pay attention to these things earlier because inflammation could be having an impact and leading to these symptoms. Now, if those symptoms get really bad, then maybe your doctor will be able to give you a diagnosis because it matches something, but you can still do something about it if you catch it in the subclinical yeah. area. Yeah, and, and that's... No matter where you're at, even if you are diagnosable, there's still so much in most cases you can do to improve your health. That's most of my patients is that they they do they have been labeled with certain things by conventional medicine. And there's still so much you can do. But obviously, we want to be as preventative as we can be for people to start waking up so that it doesn't get that bad. But there's definitely hope for even the serious cases. There's so much hope. And those are the people I see on an hourly basis. And it inspires me so much of what the body's capable of doing with these inflammatory problems. And I think that's the dichotomy of the time that we live in. While these numbers of autoimmune conditions and chronic inflammatory problems are of, of epidemic rates, the other side of it is we understand them more than ever. And we more and more access is being gained to get people these tools that they need to start improving their life. Let's take autoimmune as an example. Mm -hmm. Connect the dots as a practical example of how inflammation over time can lead to a full-blown autoimmune disorder. Let's pick one of the autoimmune conditions. And if you yeah. could just walk the listeners of this podcast through so that they can really understand the connection in context. Sure, that's a good good point. So the, it's estimated that there's 50 million Americans with an autoimmune condition. There's over 100 known autoimmune conditions that we know and science recognizes them today. And there's an additional 40 above that 100 that have, at least have an autoimmune component. So we're dealing with well over 100 different disease pathologies that we understand either are full-blown autoimmune or at least have an autoimmune component. And the reality is the more that science understands how certain diseases operate, we're going to find, in my opinion, there's going to be autoimmune components to way more health problems than we even realized. Uh, but the immune system's attacking the cell. The immune system is turning against the body and thinking it's a pathogen, a virus, a bacteria, and there's a cross-reactivity. There's molecular mimicry. There, there's sort of the case of mistaken identity when the immune system says, I'm going to attack that thyroid, or I'm going to attack the nerves, or I'm going to attack the adrenal glands, or whatever the case may be. The most common 
autoimmune disease known today as Hashimoto's disease or autoimmune thyroiditis. It's actually the first autoimmune condition ever discovered in science. Um, the guy's last name was Hashimoto's naturally. I, I, if I ever discovered a disease, I would never want it like it be it my last name to be named after one, but it, it was a thing, I guess. <laughs> But that's what he's known for all these years later. But uh, the reality is, let's look at this. The criteria for diagnosis for these health problems are really end-stage problems. So in functional medicine, we understand it to be this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. From one end is silent autoimmunity, meaning if you ran labs, you may see some high antibodies, but the person's living their life, they don't feel any different, and they just see these, these antibodies, these flags for destruction, which is what antibodies are. And then the second stage is autoimmune reactivity, meaning they're having symptoms, they don't feel well, uh, but they don't fit the full criteria to be labeled in stage three, which is the full-blown autoimmune disease. It's almost like it's not bad enough. It's not bad so enough. So you can't give them a diagnosis. And a lot of people in that stage too, I, a lot of my patients, they're told things like, well, it looks like lupus because the ANA is positive. It looks autoimmune because it does and because maybe of health history, like a family history, but it doesn't check all the boxes. It doesn't fit the full criteria. So for example, Addison's disease, autoimmune adrenal disease, you have to have 90% destruction of your adrenal glands before it fits mainstream medicine's conventional standards to call it Addison's disease. That's almost all of the adrenal glands destroyed. Your house is smoking. We can see a little bit of flame, but it's still standing. Yes. So we're not going to... Everyone will just watch it fall. We'll just watch it fall, watch it burn. And it's it sounds sounds crazy what I'm saying. It sounds so ludicrous, but that's what goes on. And that's just Addison's disease. Similar numbers for MS. Similar numbers for other autoimmune conditions. Celiac disease. These are vastly underdiagnosed because of the level of destruction that has to happen before we like to call it something and give it a steroid or an immunosuppressant. And that's all the options that these people are really given. Other than IVIG, I guess occasionally, but for the most of the part, point, for most part, it's they're given steroids and immunosuppressants, and anybody on those medications will tell you it's no utopia once they're labeled and given that medication. And really, what you're pointing out is that well-meaning practitioners, health practitioners, yeah. are doing the best they can, are following their education, and this comes back to this larger aspect. They were talked. They were taught a little bit about inflammation in medical school, just from the concept that, that it existed, yeah. how it played a role. But there's some key things that are not part of our medical training that people like my business partner, Dr. Mark Hyman, talk about um, that obviously we're working on changing through the different mm -hmm. partnerships that we have. But there's some key things that, especially in the last 50 years, have been understood that play a big role when it comes to inflammation. So let's talk about, let's switch topics for one second. Where's all this root cause, what's the root cause of this inflammation mm -hmm. spectrum that people are dealing with? And how are some of those things, uh, and which one of those things are not really part of like the medical training right now? Yeah, well, I think food is, we have to start there. And most of your listeners obviously get that already, but a lot of the country and the world still doesn't get that. And especially when they go to their conventional doctor and they say, well, food has nothing to do with this. Food has nothing to do with your depression. And a lot of the emerging research and science that's in the space has been coming out in the last 15 years, yeah. besides just patients' anecdotal experience and, right. and of one sort of stuff. So how is it that food? Just do us a little short recap. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between food and inflammation? Every food we eat is feeding inflammation or fighting it. There's no benign food. There's no Switzerland meal that's like just neutral and it's doing nothing. It's doing something to your biochemistry. Now, of course, there's a spectrum as far as that's concerned. There's ones that are going to be mild modulators and be some be major modulators of our biochemistry and instructing inflammatory cascades. But largely the standard American diet is there's a, a great disparity between that and our genetics. So research estimates that our genome, our DNA hasn't changed in 10,000 years, but yet look at our food supply. It's changed very dramatically in a very short period of time when you're looking at the total existence of the human race. So that's the problem because these gene predispositions have been around for 10,000 years. But why are they being awoken like never before in just the last couple decades? 
and in our lifetime even you can see the numbers rise why is that well in part it's our food supply and what we've done to it and we've seen over the last hundred years a vast rise of chronic health problems because of the the, the impact that we have uh, the 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 uh turmoil and the trauma that we put on the earth, the, the, the mineral depletion of the soil, the amount of hybridization and genetic modification and the glyphosate spraying and just food being really not even food anymore for a vast amount of people. Uh, that's a problem, but it's not just food, obviously. It's yeah. A, your book focuses a lot on food because that's a place where a lot of people can start. It's something yeah. that we do you know, one to three times a day, depending on who the person is. Mm -hmm. But big picture, give us a couple other areas. Just touch on them of how those areas are linked to the inflammation spectrum. Yeah, and I and I wanted the book to talk about these non-food things because I see that so many times people that got all the food things down, right? They're eating decently, but these non-food inflamers can really keep them back. So we have to look at stress and really look at stress. And I mean chronic stress. The human race is here because we could handle a certain level of stress. And, and, and you look at the totality of human existence, we actually went through a lot more stressful times. We live in, in many ways for a lot of the human race, they live quite better than most humans lived. But we're talking about this insidious uh, chronic stress that we are not adapted to genetically. And that is like, we're being chased by a tiger, but there's no tiger and it never goes away. So then we have to look at technology, we have to look at environmental toxins and the stress that's having on our DNA and looking at those as separate problems too, looking at technology and the impact that's, that's having to us, looking at things like social isolation, looking at sleep. Sleep is a problem, or I should say sleep is not the problem. The lack of sleep is the problem that's going on today because people are so stressed out and they aren't uh, giving the giving quality restorative sleep the, the respect it deserves. This is not a luxury. This is not, I'm going to sleep when I'm dead, which people say that in jest. This is a mandate on your health. And it, just one night of poor sleep, just one night will raise high sensitivity C-reactive protein or raise inflammation. But yet, how many people do we know? It's not a one night problem. This is a continual, I just don't get enough sleep. Right. And the body's very resilient. It can make up for, you know, a little bit here and there. But yeah. as you're saying, when it's chronic, when it becomes part of our lifestyle, mm -hmm. when we're drinking caffeine afternoon, when we're regularly going to sleep at odd hours, we don't have yeah. the best quality. We're using our phone all the way. You add those years, you add those days up, they turn into years. Yeah. And now all of a sudden this becomes the foundation of your, of your life. Yes, we have to look at food. We have to look at stress. We have to look at toxins. We have to look at sleep. We have to look at social connection because while we're so connected right now on social media, it's not actually the same as real social connection. So people are connected because they're scrolling through their phone. They think they're connected, but people are so isolated and the impact that's having on our biochemistry because humans... Uh, it's just it's been shown in many many studies that social connection improves health and lowers inflammation levels and then looking at the blue light uh, aspect of of technology and smartphones and the different uh, waves that people are being exposed to we don't know the long-term effects of this but i think in the short term you can see anecdotally that we are having a problem a uh, real problem and there's the again this growing mismatch between genetics and epigenetics that, that's at the heart of it so we got something fun coming up. We have a, you've brought a, a case study of one of your patients that you've worked with to set it up. So we talked about this area called subclinical, right? Finding the problem before it becomes a problem or looking deeper if somebody has a diagnosis into what are some of the root factors that are there. Big picture, we've talked about this podcast before. Many guests have shared that in traditional allopathic medicine, Western medicine, the body is really seen as a, a group of silos, each organ is a silo. Each system is a silo. And mm -hmm. it's only recently we're starting to peel back and start to understand that all these things are not individualized. They're connected. Yeah. Your gut has to do with your heart health. Your heart health has to do, you know, your, your teeth relate to your heart. Your brain relates to your gut. Your gut relates to your brain. It's all connected. Yeah. And as a functional medicine practitioner, part of your role with patients individually, and you still do see patients, some patients yeah. individually, is using advanced laboratory testing to help people see the connections that typically might not show up on their normal reports they get back from the doctor 
uh, along with like a deep case review. So you've brought, um, and with the ultimate goal of getting to the root of where this inflammation is coming from, yeah. how big of a problem it is, and the, of course, bringing the patient back to health. Yeah. So set us up, give us a little bit of a background uh, of what this patient was dealing with when they came into your office. Yeah, so um, yeah, my, just to get, piggyback off what you said, my day job is not writing books. It, it is seeing patients and it's my passion, my heart. I consult people around the world via webcam. And it not only is my honor to be a part of people's health journey, it, it keeps me sharp too on a clinical level because I can really be on top of the research in a way that that practice just gives us doctors like that sharpness like nothing else. Um, so with this, with that said, this is um, all HIPAA compliant. The name is removed. Let's say that. And then th th what she was going through was what a lot of my patients were going through. They're immersed in the health space because they've had to be. Ha they had to be their own health advocate because doctors are saying there's nothing wrong. It looks like autoimmune. It, you're struggling with debilitating fatigue. You have depression and anxiety. You have brain fog. You have these other inflammatory symptoms. You have digestive problems. She's eating all the good things doing all the things she's learned, but she's still struggling. She's better than what she was, meaning she got herself to a certain level of, I'm better. Uh, so she's definitely improved compared to when she first had her flares, but she isn't where she want, wants to be, and she knows there's things keeping her back. Uh, and that's typically the cases that I'm used to seeing. So what she has on the lab here, uh, first things on the, I put, what we do is we put all the blood labs on a spreadsheet. Um, and, and this is labs. And just for context, you did a whole sort of intake with her as well. Yeah. So it started you know, with a health history, health history, literally starting from like, yeah. You know, tell us how you were, you know, born via like C-section or not totally. or this, were you on antibiotics? Because labs are only a snapshot in time mm -hmm. and they can only teach you so much, but the right labs along with the right story, uh, a great practitioner like yourself and other functional medicine doctors that are out there can start to paint patterns and pictures together. Totally. So, and the a health history is another thing that we don't value enough because it can tell you so much clinical pearls that it even informs me on what labs are the most relevant. Cause that's maybe a um, critique that functional medicine gets is though you guys run so many labs. Well, if you're taking a proper health history, you really aren't. You're being comprehensive without being excessive. And I'm really only running labs where we have action steps for, where I, I want to see what's going on so we can have appropriate action steps. So we're not just running you know, superfluous labs for the sake of it or being excessive for the sake of it. And that's really where a health history is so paramount to lean into what labs are the most pertinent. Yeah, and that typically takes you like an hour to do along with the forms least, of the patients yeah. filling in compare that to most people, you show up to the doctor's office, you're getting like 10 minutes totally. and they're looking at your forms right like five minutes beforehand or yeah. during the actual yeah. appointment, which is which was always frustrating to me when I was a kid. I was yeah. like, this guy's my doctor. Yeah. Actually, we had a really great family doctor, but a few times I was referred to different specialists yeah. for dealing with things. Anyways, let's jump into it. Totally. And this is the duality of functional medicine. There's the science and there's the art. And the art is the health history. The art is talking, connecting with the person. The art is like the space in between the words of just what's that person going through. So then we get into the labs after that. And then what we see here is that she had high ferritin levels. So ferritin is a biomarker to gauge for stored iron, uh, but it's also considered an acute phase reactant. So basically in states of inflammation, you can see ferritin spiking, and this was spiked for her because in the present, there, there was normal iron, there's normal iron saturation, all the other iron markers were normal except her ferritin. So in the context with the health history, going back to that, it makes sense. You could see these inflammatory markers being spiked. And a lot of these labs actually, I put in a sidebar in the book so people can kind of see what the optimal range is. Because that's why I have the spreadsheet. Because it's looking at IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine's optimal ranges. Which is the nonprofit training organization that trains all these functional doctors like yourself. Exactly. So I'm not looking at the lab's reference range. I am because I want to put it in context, but I am not looking at it to give a functional medicine perspective. So I'm looking at both, looking at the conventional side, looking at the functional medicine side, so I can explain and educate the patient and empower them on what's going on with their body. 
Um, and the next thing I see going on is she had slightly functionally low white blood cells. So what that means is that she had a sort of a chronic immune stressor. It's non-specific. It's not saying what's going on here, but that's why we run more labs to kind of give context to that. So this is looking at the what more or less here as far as the immune system, um, but it's not looking at the why, but we will get into that. And for the, for the white blood cells, were they out of the normal range? That was, that was it was the tail end of the low end of normal on a lab conventional reference range. So she could still, you know, maybe a conventional doctor who didn't know her full history, everything like that, didn't have the time because of the pressures of seeing patients yeah. might say like, okay, this is a little abnormal, but fine, whatever. It's not crazy. Totally. But you're using this as one of the pieces of information to put this story together and saying there's soldiers on the street at an elevated level that you haven't had before. Mm -hmm. Something is going on outside. Right. And at one point it would have been high and then now it's at this lower chronic level. But here's the bigger point here. I see lab low white blood cells for on patients and they knew about it. They they say, oh, that's normal for me. And it has been going on for years. And this is, that's just one example right. where at the lab actually oftentimes will call these things out, but there's no discussion around it. Mm. It's just like, well, yeah, well, there's, if there's not a clear medication for it, it's like, I'll oh, see you later. There's nothing you see that, it. we don't know what to do. Yeah, exactly. But we can give the context to it. Uh, she also had low T3 levels, which your thyroid hormone is predominantly produced in the form of T4, a tyrosine protein and four iodine molecules. It's converted in the liver. 80% of T4 is converted to T3 in the liver. 20% of the conversion of T4 to T3 happens in the gut microbiome with the healthy balanced microbiota of the microbiome. Uh, so she had what we would call in functional medicine low T3 syndrome, where her body was not activating that thyroid hormone. So she had the, the lower levels of our body's gasoline. Every cell of our body has a thyroid receptor site. So she was sluggish, but believe me, her fatigue, which she was dealing with debilitating fatigue, this is not the totality of her fatigue, but it was a component. And that's another point to bring up here is that people want the magic bullet and think, what's the one thing? Yeah. Why am I tired? Well, sometimes there's magic bullets, but oftentimes it's a confluence, a perfect storm of a lot of different things that will give rise to why somebody feels the way that they Especially do. Especially if it was that she can remember back to, you know, whatever age this individual is, but just putting out an example, if somebody was in their twenties and had really good energy and then now they're in their mid 40s or late 50s and if it went slowly down over a period of time that's a mm -hmm. good example that it's a bunch of things exactly you know it's not one thing yeah, that led compounded. to that so it's a bunch of things that are there maybe it's the thyroid is 15 percent of it maybe it's you know something else is related to it maybe it's food sensitivities that all these things add up to the reason why somebody might be dealing with exactly fatigue. and this is the inflammation spectrum these compounded issues that are driving dysfunction in the body um and then she had some nutrient deficiencies uh, that we want to work on because some of them have to do with the thyroid conversion itself, like selenium is used to make the enzyme 5 prime deiodinase, which you need to convert T4 to T3. She had a selenium deficiency. Um, she had a bit of iodine deficiency as well. She had vitamin D, magnesium uh, deficiencies. And, and magnesium, for example, we've had Sean Stevenson on the podcast and Dr. Hyman talks about this a lot himself. Magnesium is not just like a random mineral, yeah. it's used in over 400 different yeah. mechanisms inside the body. Four different, 400 different actions in the body need magnesium to happen. So when you're low, that's 400 things that can happen exactly the way that they're needed to. Yeah, it's nature's chill pill. It's nature's Xanax. <laughs> and, and many other ways, and many other important pathways as well. But Many people, she had depression and anxiety. I mean, this was a component to why she was feeling the way that she was. Again, way more complex than just magnesium deficiency, but it's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and I, I didn't want to skip over this, but I did, so I'll go back to it. She had high reverse T3, which it's basically a certain percentage of our thyroid hormone is converted into something called reverse T3 or RT3. You'll see on the lab sometimes. It's an unusable form of the thyroid hormone. It's like the the brakes on the checks and balances of our thyroid hormone conversion. You need the brakes. We need a certain level of brakes for balance in the body, the Goldilocks principle. But sh she had a lack of balance there. She had too much brakes because basically what will happen is the reverse T3 will bind to the thyroid re receptor site but be unusable. So you'll elicit a lot of that those low thyroid symptoms because your body's making too much reverse T3 
What can cause that? Stress, chronic infections, inflammation, cortisol disruptions can all contribute to high reverse T3. Um, and then sort of the, what I would consider from a health history standpoint and a workup standpoint, I would consider the upstream components to her problem, this specific person's problem, to be chronic infections. Meaning I think a lot of what was going on, <clears throat> and we didn't go over her gut yet, there was things going on in her gut and a lot of gut-centric inflammation as we see that, but she also had a mold exposure and she had uh, cr uh, Lyme co-infections. So it was really a trifecta of those upstream chronic infections that were driving the inflammation that was impacting her gut brain axis, impacting her brain hormonal axis, her hormones were all, all out of balance as well. So this is um, the things we found out through her labs. And all those things, all those pieces of the puzzle, they all are impacting and placing her on the inflammation spectrum at different degrees. And the totality of it is that I feel like I'm doing things right, but I'm still not getting better. Yeah. Exactly. So high level and, and just zoom out. If you can remember, I know we have a lot of the labs printed out, but yeah. just big picture. <clears throat> what, what were some of the labs that you had done just high level? So you looked at her gut microbiome. These are yeah. all tests that have to be ordered through a doctor mm -hmm. and a good functional medicine doctor or individual out there that has access to these emerging labs. And again, some of them are conventional can run yeah. for you, but just big picture. You looked at her Gut microbiome. Yeah, so we did a full microbiome panel. We did a two or three day collection of her gut microbiome. It's a stool test. So it looks at the, basically the landscape of the microbiome. So it looks at good bacteria, any bacter bacterial imbalances or dysbioses. Looks at yeast and fungal overgrowth. And it's a DNA test to see what types of yeast and fungal overgrowths are there. We look at digestion and absorption. We look at inflammation in the gut. We're running inflammatory proteins in the gut like calprotectin and lysozyme that are basically immune markers that when they're high, it's, it's, it's indicative of a state of inflammation as far as the gut is concerned. And remember, like Hippocrates said, the father of medicine, all disease begins in the gut. Well, to understand inflammation, inflammation is a product of the immune system. We have to look at where the predominance of the immune system resides. It's in the gastrointestinal system. So looking at the gut is not only pertinent from a digestive standpoint, but it's also pertinent from a brain health standpoint. It's also pertinent from an immunological standpoint and an autoimmune standpoint. So it has far reaching implications. And so break down the gut and then the immune system in the gut Listeners of this podcast have heard this before. Yeah. Just in case somebody's new and they need a little bit of a recap. I always love recaps. It's the yeah. way to learn is you remember. Right. Remembering is learning. Yeah. Uh, so tell us more. Why is our vast majority of our immune cells in the gut and our immune system is considered to be in the gut? Mm -hmm. And how is that affected? Yeah. So first of all, I find fascinating because this is the Broken Brain podcast, your gut and brain are formed from the same fetal tissue. Uh, meaning the baby is, when babies are growing in their mom's womb, they're growing from the same tissue, the gut and brain, and they're inextricably linked for the rest of our lives to the gut brain axis. And if you think about it, the intestines uh, even look like the brain. Uh, and 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut and stored in your gut. Most of your followers know this, but many people still don't. So many mental health issues begin in the gut or at least have gut components and should be looked at for many people, not everybody. Um, but it wields a lot of influence. And when you look at the enteric nervous system and the amount of the microbiota in the gut, there's over different studies will say different numbers, but about 100 trillion bacteria in our, in our gut. We have about 10 trillion human cells. So if you go off of that number, you're about 10 times more bacteria than human. A sort of like a sophisticated host for this microbiome metropolis. And they wield a lot of influence on our immune system. So zooming out big picture, I'm sure this patient was a while ago, but can you remember at least high level what some of the solutions were that you brought in mm -hmm. to help her address these issues, these chronic effect infections, mold? And we've had people like Dave Asri and we've had um, Dr. Ann Shippey who's considered one of the top functional medicine mold experts from Austin, Texas on the podcast. And they've talked about just how much havoc mold can wreak on the body, mm -hmm. body, how it can make it look like Lyme disease is sort of expressing yeah. itself. It's like so complicated. Some of it's above my head. Uh, but what were some of the things that you did 
for yeah. this patient. Yeah, and that is a, a good point to bring up is she had, some of the things we looked at was not just the epigenetic stuff, not just the gut and the brain and the hormones and all the different th things we just talked about, but it's also looking at the genetic component to it. This lady had methylation genetic SNP, like the MTHFR gene variant. Basically her body was slower at methylating, which you need to detox and for healthy hormones and gut and brain function. Uh, she had a, a double SNP, of the MTHFR C677T allele, which is a more problematic. It inhibits the conversion of, of folic acid into folate by like 70%, some, somewhere around that. So her body, she had high homocysteine levels, another form of inflammation that I talk about in the book. She had it. Um, and she also had these gene variants to the different cannabinoid gene variants, which the endocannabinoid system, people are hearing a lot about CBD oil and how that works. Well. It works on the endocannabinoid system, the ECS. And she had these gene variants that uh, predisposed her in part to being higher, a, highly, a higher likelihood of having these food reactivities to things like lectins and alkaloids and just food sensitivities at large. Um, because what research is showing is that the gut is rich with these CB1 receptors, these endocannabinoid uh, receptors that make, and this is associated with higher inflammation levels. So a lot of people on this inflammation spectrum, specifically the autoimmune inflammation spectrum, are have a highly higher likelihood of having these different methylation gene SNPs, these detox gene variants, these slower detox genes, and slower cannabinoid gene variants. So with that said, we looked at that, that as well. Which yeah, is, you're not using 23 and Me to look at that. You're looking at like a doctor level, yeah. you know, genetics test. And we can use the raw gene data from 23 and Me and things like that. Right, but you can export it and put it into certain yeah, software. They're, they're not giving that to the layperson. Right. Um, and so what we did is I went upstream to deal with the chronic infections first. We put her on different uh, herbal antimicrobial protocols that took months. It was not a quick fix, but this lady is living her life now. She's feeling fantastic. She's 70 to 80% better. She's actually still in care. This isn't that old of a case. Um, and she's, she's so much better than she was, but it was still not a quick fix because dealing anybody dealing with mold toxicity and chronic Lyme infections and co-infections will tell you this is not a quick fix, even with the best doctor out there. But with that said, we're, we hit the ground running with dealing with these problems, different antimicrobial protocols for the chronic infections, different detox protocols for the mold problem, removing the source as well, because she had mold not only in her house, but in her car. Like she was, there was some sort of drainage problem in her car and she was breathing it in every day. Again, she had these detox gene variants that her body wasn't a good detoxer, not a good methylator. Her endocannabinoid system wasn't the strongest. So that that's a lot of the governing system of regulating inflammation and clearing out pathogens and toxins. So some people could tolerate some of these stressors. She couldn't. A lot of my patients can't. That's like a, a glass size. They have smaller glasses, so to speak. Yeah, this is why personalized medicine is so important. Some people can handle certain things, yeah. other people can't. Totally. So we can't change our glass size. We can't change our genetic tolerance to stressors, but we can change what we put in the glass. So we started to empty the glass, proverbially speaking. And I just want to say that you're not just making this up. You're following sort of a systems-based approach outlined by the Institute of Functional <laughs> Medicine, along with your own yeah. experience. No, I'm not making it all. When, when I say up. you're not making the solution up in terms of no. how to approach her, I'm not. There's a reason it. you started with chronic infections first, and yeah. then moved to the next thing and the next thing. Yeah, because that's the methodology that's taught in the in IFM, the Institute totally. of Functional Medicine. And every doctor has their little art Tweak to it. it right? Yeah, they have their art and dance to it. But you're right, we have to go upstream. And I think most of my colleagues would agree with me. You have to start with those things. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I want to zoom out here because we only have a little bit of time. You're on your book tour. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what's the message? This can sound very overwhelming. And people just heard a bunch of different labs and numbers yeah. and other things, even though I think that the listeners of this podcast love to geek out and they get do. an understanding. Yeah. And really they want to become the CEO of their health. Yes. Right? Maybe the CEO isn't the one that's working on the deep financials. Maybe the CEO isn't the one that's in the actual manufacturing plant, making the product. Maybe the CEO isn't the one that's building out the server and building out the code, but they need to understand the relationship and yes. be conversational in it. So I think the guest here and our, our, sorry, our listeners on this podcast, they want to understand the relationship so they can be smarter because at the end of the day, you have to be an advocate for your own health. If you're not an advocate, 
you kind of become a victim of the system. Yeah. Right. So that all being said, what's the point that you want to share with people about inflammation? Because it seems so pervasive. There's so many mm. things that can affect us. Yeah. It's already complicated enough to think about what food should I eat? Yeah. Right. What's the message of hope inside this book and through your work? Yeah. I mean, for every sobering statistic I talk about in the book, for every state of affairs as, as it is today, as far as health is concerned, there is a message of grace and lightness. And that's really my message. And you'd think having this conversation, it isn't. But if you read the book, if you know what I, my, my heart and my passion is, it's really to give people tools to improve their life and realizing, yes, this is overwhelming at the, on one end of it, but let's shift our paradigm to like, oh, I can't, I have to be, understand all this stuff and I, I, where do I even start to really, what can I start doing today to lean into it? Because what I found for the majority of humans is they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to know all the things. They can, as long as they're progressing and leaning into it and start making changes, it's a journey and to really not stress about it. And I get it, it's sometimes there's too much content for the vessel. Sometimes there's too much information out there content on content and content, good content, great content, amazing content, empowering content, but it's too much for the vessel. So sometimes people just have to turn off their phones. Sometimes people just have to turn off the computer or put down the book and just say, I'm going to absorb what I can absorb right now. And I'm going to start with the next thing that I intuitively, because our gut, you know, there's a reason why we say we get a gut feeling about something. Yeah. So usually most people can think about, okay, there's all these different options, but intuitively, I kind of feel like I'm leaning towards this. Yes. When I didn't know anything about functional medicine, all these labs, uh, I was basically told about a version of the elimination diet, but people mm -hmm. were just telling me back then about gluten and dairy. I mm -hmm. didn't know the word elimination. This is back in 2000, 2001. Yeah. And all I did with the information that I had is that I'm gonna try, and you talk about this in your book and you lay out how to start off with an elimination diet if people haven't done that before. Yeah, I'm just gonna try a month, 30 days with no, I didn't even know what gluten was back then, it was just wheat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I was just, I'm gonna try no wheat and no dairy, which was the vast majority of my calories because I was a skinny little Indian vegetarian kid. <laughs> and somebody said, maybe, you know, we're learning a little bit more about how dairy can be inflammatory. It's the first time I've ever heard this word was I was at a lecture here in Los Angeles and this woman who's more coming at it from an animal rights perspective was like, we're learning about how dairy can be inflammatory. I'm like, inflammatory? Like I literally just graduated high school. Yeah. Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> but she's like, try because yeah. inflammation can somehow, I didn't get it back then, can yeah. impact your acne. Try to go off of dairy and maybe wheat or sugar for a little while, see what happens. So mm -hmm. even if people are listening and they feel the slightest 1% of being overwhelmed, there's practical solutions like the elimination diet. And that radically, doing that experiment radically changed my life. Not mm -hmm. only improved my acne, my acne was gone and everybody's different. Yeah. But I saw so much improvement in my mental health and other factors that are out there. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It's just simple changes. So in the book I, I made it as simple as it can be and even the book's only been out for a couple of days now what i'm hearing about on people online is that what i hope to be is the case that this is not as complicated as people think it is when they just give their body patience and grace and move through the process it's not a quick fix to take back your health what took years to get to where you're at today is going to take time but we're in this together you have a whole field of of healthcare um, practitioners and professionals in functional medicine that understand what you're going through. It's great. So the book is out officially. Congratulations, Inflammation Spectrum. Find your food triggers and reset your system. It's a really fascinating read and just helping people break down the sort of core central fact that inflammation is a big part of why we're feeling the way that we're feeling today. And the more that we're aware of it, the more we can we can deal with it. Yeah. Uh, Will, People can still work with you as a patient. Mm -hmm. You're out there. That's, People can find you on drwillcole.com. Yeah. We have the link in the show notes out there. And from all over the world, you work with people. And yeah. can they still get tests and everything like that? Yeah, we, we have a virtual clinic, a telehealth functional medicine clinic. And we're used to all the logistics as far as shipping is concerned. We have patients all around the United States, around the world, because we're not replacing their primary care physician or their specialist. We are providing functional medicine guidance and clinical oversight on 
what their health looks like from a functional medicine perspective. So the book is out there, The Inflammation Spectrum. People can find it on Amazon, find the show notes that are out there. And where can people find you online on social media? I know you're pretty active in the, yeah. in the group podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's at Dr. Will Cole. It's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E. You can find me. And inside the book, a few things that I want to shout out to people that they can uh, check out that we didn't have the time to get into now is uh, your approach to intermittent fasting, uh, the top foods that fight inflammation that are there, which I thought was really great that you uh, that you covered inside and other tips for uh, stress. Dr. Will Cole, thank you for coming back on the Broken Brain Podcast and trying something fun by covering that case study. That was really cool. I think that gives people an idea of uh, putting themselves in the patient's shoes and mm -hmm. seeing all the different factors that play a role on that. We super appreciate you. Thanks for having me.